Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to be talking about a rather experimental thing called ultrasonic pretreatment. Let's get started. Okay, so first off I'd like to thank all my Patreons, specifically Chris Turner, and all my PayPal donators for helping out the channel. Uh, if you want to check those out too, go ahead. Their link is down in the description. So on Friday night, I was doing some research on terminology and I was going through Google Scholar, as I do quite often, and this study just sort of randomly popped up. Ultrasound enhanced glucose release from corn in ethanol plants. And like, it has nothing to do with terminology, but I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I read the abstract and I was like, holy crap. Why have I never heard of this before? So I downloaded the study and then I started re researching related studies. I found a few others. I got three of them here. There are eight in total that I'm going to link to down in the description though. There are definitely more out there as well. Now I want to preface the rest of this video by saying that I don't own an ultrasonic bath so I couldn't test this out. Um, but I know of someone who does and he's made a video of himself using it. I also know the liquor fairy. Uh, it's bearded and bored. So I will likely be asking him if he would like to do a simple experiment to see if this would work. I don't think very many people will ever actually attempt what I'm going to be talking about in this video. It's probably cost prohibitive for anything but small samples unless you are working with very large quantities and you're one of the larger craft distilleries or a full professional full-size you know distillery but at the same time it's entirely possible that this could make a product that couldn't be made any other way and so some of us should at least try it out if we have the ability to do so to see what happens what is ultrasonic pretreatment essentially as laid out by these studies you create a mash they refer to them as a slurry essentially mix water and milled grains and you treat it to ultrasonic bombardment and for some short amount of time in these studies i'll be referencing in this video they are all less than 60 seconds of treatment but at the same time they're very small quantities they're using their test samples are uh, 50 mil centrifuge containers like this one and they're only filling them up to uh, 35 milliliters so it's about that much not much at all but i still think in the quantities that we use as hobbyists this might be able to be done for not an outlandish amount of money at the hobby scale all that said these studies saw significant increases in the amount of starch being released the amount of glucose being produced from that starch and the amount of ethanol being produced so it might be worth paying a little bit extra just to get more bang for your buck from the grains that we're using so before i get into what the studies say and i'm only going to talk about four of the eight studies they're all important but the video would be quite long if i did that uh, i kind of want to explain exactly what is going on when they're doing the ultrasonic pretreatment so essentially and i'm going to put a photo up showing this first uh, effect the ultrasonic waves are doing two things the first is causing what's called cavitation and uh, essentially the stretching and compression of the the liquid from these ultrasonic waves creates a bubble in this liquid very tiny tiny bubble some of them you might not even be able to see this bubble then rapidly implodes and it does it in a non-uniform way. When it eventually collapses, it creates a huge amount of mechanical energy and heat. And this forces the liquid to essentially shoot out like a jet. If you've ever dropped a stone into a pond, you notice how it creates a cavity and then the cavity fills back in and it shoots back up and like a drop of water comes up. It's similar to something like that happening, except it's very tiny and it's happening at supersonic speed and temperatures in the thousands of Kelvin. So at a molecular scale, a pretty significant amount of energy being created. And what this does is, in our case, it'll smack into the birch granule. And you're doing this hundreds of thousands of times within the, uh, the ultrasonic bath or however you have your ultrasonic system set up. So it's going to break off these starch granules. And then the starch granules are going to be floating around. When we break up the starch granules, that's called gelatinization. The next step is those starch granules are going to be broken apart and they're going to become water soluble. And that's called liquefaction. Now the enzymes can get out, right? And in some of these studies, they actually put the enzymes in with the mat or with the grains while they're running the ultrasonic system. And another effect that happens, and I'll put a video up so you can see it happening, is called the streaming effect. And essentially these little currents within the liquid form. And in our case, what that's going to do is increase 
mass transfer of the liquefied starch molecules so they'll have more contact with the enzymes that are present. So you have more contact with the enzymes and these liquefied starches, you're going to get more glucose created. Let's take a look at this first study and uh, we'll see what it says. Okay, so in the first study, they only tested mashing, and this was under non-optimized conditions. So they, they had looked through the literature, they had seen nobody had ever done something similar, so they were just sort of winging it, trying to figure out what to do. To summarize the experiments in this first study, they had two sources for corn. One was MGP, who's known for making whiskey that other people put their labels on. The other, the other source was called Lincoln Way Energy. So in the case of MGP, they had a raw corn slurry. So it was milled raw corn. And in the other sample they provided, it was uh, a milled cooked corn. And then Lincoln Way Energy provided raw corn and the, uh, the people doing the study made their own slurry. They didn't explain how they made the slurry though. Some of the finer points of this study are that the increases in the glucose release are due to a decrease in starch particle sizes, better mixing due to the streaming effect, and release of what are called lipid-bound starch molecules. And the enzymes can't attach to the starch if the starch is stuck to the lipid. So a benefit of using this ultrasonication is it seems to break them apart. So what else did they see? They saw glucose release increases. So they measured the amount of glucose after enzymatic hydrolysis was finished. They saw an increase of 32% and 27% versus the control using low power and medium power respectively at 32% with the enzymes added before they started sonication. They did sonication for 40 seconds at 20 kilohertz and they were using the low power setting and which was only 254 watts and they saw 32% more than just a cooked sample, just the regular mashing method. For the medium power, it was the same. So again, they added the enzymes first. They did the sonication for 40 seconds at 20 kilohertz. They used medium power this time, 350 watts, but they only saw a 27% increase versus the control. They then tried high power, 475, watts 40 seconds 20 kilohertz what they saw here was a precipitous drop it dropped by 22 percent so 20 percent 22 percent drop in glucose release they're pretty sure it had to do with enzyme denaturation i mean they tell us in the study which enzymes they use star gen 001 from a company called genicor international so i'm imagining that was an alpha amylase and then they used an enzyme an amyloglucosidase so that's a glucoamylase that breaks off glucose and it's a debranching enzyme and they got that from Sigma, Sigma Ultra. In both cases, they're probably just standard enzymes that work at standard temperatures. And I'm wondering if they had used something like a high temperature enzyme, if this high power would have worked better because high temperature enzymes are more robust. They can absorb more energy before they start to break down. The last thing I want to talk about about this first study is that they showed that sonic, in general, they showed that sonication increased glucose release rate three times higher than non-sonicated corn. So what that means is that say it normally takes you 90 minutes to mash, this would take you 30 minutes. If it normally takes you 60 minutes to mash, this would probably take you about 20 minutes. Pretty good uh, shortening of time, especially if you're doing this commercially. So let's take a look at the, uh, the second study and see what it said. Okay, so this second study is called Ultrasound Pretreatment of Cassava Chip Slurry to Enhance Sugar Release for Subsequent Ethanol Production. So I summarized this one down even more. So they used cassava. Cassava is essentially yucca or tapioca, the different names for it based on where it's pulled out of the ground. Cassava, I think, is Africa, tapioca is Asia, and yuca is South and Central America and Mexico. Again, they did all kinds of testing, but to break it down, at low power, they had a 17% increase in the sugars release, and that's at 40 seconds and 20 kilohertz with the enzymes added in before sonication. At medium power, they had 180% increase at 40 seconds and 20 kilohertz enzymes added before and then high power they had 736 percent increase in sugars and that's after again 40 seconds 20 kilohertz but this time they added the enzymes after sonication so again in this case they they find that high power can denature the enzymes it works so well in breaking up the cell structures breaking the starches away that in this case with the cassava even though they added the enzymes after it still worked amazingly well so it seems to show that for cassava and probably other tuber or possibly other tubers that it works even better than with corn yams potatoes 
sweet potatoes, you might even be able to get a lot more out. Um, they also showed that with the cassava chips that increases in power and time had a directly proportional increase with the amount of sugar that was released. So it seems the more power you put in, the more sugar you're going to get out. They also showed that uh, you know, when you're putting in a high power, you're going to generate heat in there. They did heat testing as well to determine whether or not the heat was playing a role, and it showed it had no effect. So this one's particularly interesting if you make something like potato vodka, because you might be able to increase the amount of starches you're getting out of a potato by like a huge amount. So let's look at the, uh, the next study. The third study is even more interesting because they also did fermentation directly after. Okay, so the third study, which is ultrasound improved ethanol fermentation from cassava chips in cassava based ethanol plants. For this study, they, again, they did cassava, but this time they only ever added the enzymes afterwards. Uh, they also added yeast to ferment with along with a yeast extract for nutrients. They did a cooked versus uncooked determination and their cooking method was they would make a 5% total solids slurry. So 5% of this liquid was solid cassava. Uh, they put it in a steamer cabinet for 15 minutes at 95 degrees Celsius. Their power ratings were 75 watts for low power, 150 watts for medium power, and 300 watts for high power. Again, all at 20 kilohertz. Their fermentation was 72 hours at 32 degrees Celsius. And then they did sampling at every 12 hours. So before I get into the results, I want to explain one of the terms that I'll be using. It's called ethanol fermentation efficiency. And to get this value, they essentially, they would have measured the starch in the cassava and then calculated how much ethanol they could get if they could convert all the starch and then into glucose and then ferment all the glucose into ethanol. Um, again, yeah, their fermentation took 72 hours, but the sonicated samples actually started to plateau after 48 hours. So they would end about 24 hours earlier. Their samples themselves, they had their control, which generated 31 grams of ethanol per 100 grams of sample. The medium power and low power, both at 10 seconds and 30 seconds, also only generated 31 grams of ethanol per 100 grams of sample. The high power at 10 seconds generated 34 grams of ethanol per 100 grams. And then their high power at 30 generated 43 grams of ethanol per 100 grams of sample. That's actually pretty good. In terms of percentages, um, the control, the medium power, and the low power were about 69% percent efficient triple nice i guess the high power at 10 seconds was 76 percent efficient and the high power at 30 seconds was 95 percent efficient in terms of the cooked versus uncooked they essentially only did uh high power at 30 seconds so three approximately 300 watts for 30 seconds the uncooked control had an ethanol fermentation efficiency of 69 percent and the cooked control 75 percent and then both the uncooked sonicated and the cooked sonicated had 95%. So this shows that uncooking, so you don't have to heat it up at all, and you do a high power for 30 seconds and you'll get essentially the same as if you cooked it and sonicated. This is just leading me to believe more and more that sonicating is better than traditional mashing. So traditional mashing is typically referred to as, I guess in the food science or in the bio resources world or biotechnology world, it's called hydro cooking because you're essentially cooking it in water. I thought I'd also go into some energy, operational energy numbers. The uncooked control obviously used no energy and they got the 31 grams per 100 grams of sample. The cooked control used 22 kilojoules of energy. They got 34 grams per 100 grams sample. The uncooked but sonicated only used 11 kilojoules and they got 43 grams per 100 grams. And then the cooked and sonicated used 33 kilojoules and got the same 43 grams per 100 grams. Finally, in the study, like I said before, they showed that the, and I'll show you the graph here. Here we go, incubation time. I don't know how well you can see this. Let's see if I can, see if I can zoom in here a little better. So this dotted line here is the sonicated for 30 seconds. This dotted line here is sonicated for 10 seconds. And then this solid line here, this black solid line here is the control. So you can see that after about, what is this, about 24 hours, the sonicated for 30 seconds has reached 40 grams per 100 grams of sample. And it only goes up to 43 by the end. So it's essentially plateaued at that point. Whereas the other ones, take until about 48 hours to reach 
their plateaus. You get your fermentation done in about 24 hours sooner. So overall, pretty amazing set of studies and the other five are great as well. Like I said, there are a few more studies I've linked to down below. And if you're a commercial entity and this process intrigues you, I suggest you pay particular attention to the last study I linked to. It has an economic evaluation of running a hydro cooking versus jet cooking versus a batch ultrasonics versus, versus continuous ultrasonics. Batch is obvious, it's just in a container and you stick your transducer in it or you have the mash inside a giant ultrasonic bath. Continuous is you'd be running it through something like a pipe and there would be an ultrasonic transducer in the pipe and you'd sort of cycle it into a vessel and then through the pipe and then back into the vessel and you just cycle it for some amount of time. Hydro cooking again is just what we normally do in a vessel, you heat it up. And then jet cooking, it took me a while to find this and I'm still not completely sure if I'm right, but jet cooking is essentially they have a dry milled grain and they essentially start transferring it towards their mash tun and at the same time as it's going through this conveyor pipe they inject steam into it it cooks it and it creates a slurry so when it comes out in the mash tun it's wet cooked semi-gelatinized feedstock whatever it is so that study shows in absolute terms of ethanol efficiency, jet cooking is slightly better than batch, which is slightly better than continuous, which is slightly better than um, the hydro cooking. And in, in this one, in that study, they call hydro cooking um, corn slurry, or just regular corn slurry. But when they break it down in terms of energy used, money spent on both capital and operating expenses, batch and continuous are more economically beneficial. So you pay more to buy an ultrasonic system, but it's vastly cheaper to run an ultrasonic system than to heat up, either using a jet cooking or hydro cooking. It's a pretty interesting effect. I looked all around the internet to see if anybody else is doing this for beverage distillation, including home distillers just messing about, and I couldn't find a single mention of it. So the thing I'm wondering is, you know, what else gets knocked loose or what other changes happen during that pre-treatment? It, it could make some interesting beverages, an interesting bourbon, whiskey, whatever. Um, the idea of gin also popped into my head and I Googled it and I saw there's actually a distillery in the UK producing an ultrasonicated gin and they're actually donating some of the proceeds to bat protection in their area. So yeah, there's a bunch of other things you can do with ultrasonics besides the rapid aging that most people automatically jump to when you mention ultrasonics. I'm also wondering what you can do, I don't know if I said this before, but what you can do with other fruit, like if I'm making a brandy or an eau de vie or a slivovitz or whatever, the flesh in those material or in those feedstocks is going to be similar to cassava or tubers versus something like corn and you might be able to get a lot more out of those fruit or whatever you're using instead of the traditional method. Something else we can figure out in the future. So that's it for ultrasonic pretreatment. Um, remember the studies are down in the description. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more. Please check out the Patreon merch store or, or the PayPal donation link if you'd like to help out. No pressure though and have a great week.